to you. Okay, nowadays, uh, develop, uh, companies, most of the companies encountering the problem that they need to accelerate development uh, process. Uh, the average time of, of a sprint is about two, be two weeks. Because of that, most of the companies use open source more often. Actually, this number is, some, is under approximation to the real use of open source. In some domain, it's much higher than that. And this is basically great because open source is there. It's for, our, for us to use. In most cases, the license is OK, and it solves our pro problem very quickly. The main problem is that open source, like basically any other pro uh, program, contains problems. Among, our, among our other things, it contains security vulnerabilities. And we must remediate those security vulnerability in order to, to make sure that those security vulnerability will not put our application at risk. In ideal, ideal work, we will remediate all the problems and fix them immediately. Uh, but in real life, uh, we need to prioritize the work because we have some limited number of resources and we cannot remediate all the problem at once. So we need to decide which vulnerability to work first and which we can postpone to later sprints. Without knowing anything, without any special technology, the standard prioritization techniques is just looking at the severity. The severity is not enough. We, there are many examples that vulnerability has high severity and does not put the application at risk at all. And a medium severity, CVE, for example, can put the application in a very serious uh, risk. So because of that, we need more than that in order to prioritize the work and decide which CVE we will work now and which we will postpone to, late, to later sprint. What if we have some special technology that can say that some of the vulnerability does not put the application at risk at all, even if they, are, they have some high severity uh, uh, regarding the marking. So, so if we know that, we can postpone the work on those CVE to future sprint, or we cannot work on them at all. It doesn't matter because they are not hurting the application. The main idea is to look at the, at, at the library, to look at the CVE, to look, basically CVE or vulnerability is just a piece of code in the application. So, so what we need to do, we need to check basically if this piece of code is accessible by the application. If we know that this piece of code, the vulnerable code, cannot be accessible to the application, so it's perfectly safe uh, to use that open source reg regardless the fact that it contains some security vulnerability. And this leads us to the main observation of vulnerability effectiveness. What is vulnerability effectiveness? We will say that a CVE in some open source component is effective if it, made, if it contains some execution path from the application, from the proprietary code to that uh, piece of code. In that case, we know that the attacker can take advantage of that, that CVE and can cause some input that will lead the program to there and can uh, do something harmful. So it can put our application at risk. On the other end, if we know that some piece of code regarding this uh, CVE is, is, is unreachable on every input, it's basically a dead code. We cannot reach that uh, vulnerability at all. Nevertheless, what will be the input or what will be the use case? So we can safely say that this uh, CVE is ineffective, and it can be there, but it will not uh, cause any problem to our application. OK, so this is the technology that we want to develop, technology that will take the application, will take all the, all, all the open source component, and will decide which, are, which CVE are uh, harmful, which CVE uh, can be rich, and, which, and more important than that, uh, which CVE cannot be rich. Uh, for doing that, let's for a moment look at this illustration. This illustration describes uh, the ratio between dependency and proprietary code. And when the proprietary code uses some uh, dependency, it has small amount of dependency. Those dependencies are called the direct dependency. Those are the dependencies that we are using, uh, using our dependency manager. But those dependencies is a program, so those dependencies uses, uses also direct dependency for them, so for, but for the proprietary code, this will be a second level dependency, and we have the third level dependency, and so on. So obviously, most of the, most of the code, most of the code uh, lies on the indirect dependency, and therefore also most of the CV, most of the vulnerability at open source will come from an indirect dependency. Therefore, if we want to analyze the program and understand 
which CVE can make some damage to our application, we need to analyze everything, not just the proprietary code as we are doing in some SaaS tools, and not just the direct dependency as we are doing in some SCA tools, we need to al analyze everything, the, the proprietary code, the direct dependency, and also the indirect dependency, and then only then we can come into conclusion if we have some ineffective vulnerabilities. Okay, so let's examine this in a bit more detail using that illustra illustration, this idea. Suppose we have some application, proprietary code, and this application uses some uh, libraries, as a direct and indirect dependencies. And one of the dependencies is G function that uses another library, that uses another library with a reported vulnerability, CVE1 and CVE2. And suppose that G function is the only connection from the proprietary code to this library. And G function uses only two APIs, API1 and API3. So we know that API1 call the code of CVE1. So we'll say that CVE is effective because we, we have a trace from the proprietary code to that vulnerable code, the trace that go to G and therefore API1 and then to the CVE. But uh, what is more important, CVE2 is ineffective because regardless of the input, we cannot reach CVE2 because it will be reached by some other API of the library but not API 1 and nor API 3. So, so it's perfectly safe from the application point of view to, to use that library uh, regard, uh, regarding the CVE 2. So this is the main idea, to, 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 to give those marks to, to, to CVE. So standard SCA tools will say those are the dependencies and some of them can put the application at risk because they contain some security vulnerabilities. With this technology, we will get again the list of the library with those marks of the, of the CVE, but each CVE will get additional mark whether or not it's effective or ineffective. And if something is ineffective, it will be unreachable in every, in every execution path, uh, including some reflective uh, call to the library if we have some reflection or something in Java or something similar in, in other languages. So, so we, want, uh, we want to develop a technology like that. And please notice that the important ma mark is the ineffective and not the effective because without this technology, we're assuming that everything is effective. With this technology, some of the library will stay effective, but we succeeded to prove that some of them, or hopefully most of them, will be ineffective. It means that there cannot be armed application in any execution path uh, and uh, actually in any, in, 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 in at any practical use, we can use the, that open source, open source surf, safely regarding those CVEs. Okay, so we want to develop technology that will calculate that, how we can do that. So, so this is not at the scope of the presentation to explain deeply how we are doing that, but I will try to give you some intuition and if you have questions, just stop, stop me and ask as we go or at the Q&A session. So let's look at this uh, Hello World uh, Python program. Uh, at this program, we have some proprietary code at main function. We have also some uh, two dependency. One is a animal, uh, animal uh, a library that contains, uh, a, for example, monkey class, and some food library that contain, for example, implementation to banana, carrot, and worm. And so we have a proprietary code. We have uh, uh, two dependencies. And we want to understand what are the connection, what are, what are the relationship between the, the, the components in the program. So we start analyzing the program and we understand, for example, that at that location we are calling the monkey constructor. constructor. So the location when we are calling some function is called a call site and the function that we are calling called the target of the call site. So at that location, the, uh, the, the, that call site, the target is the constructor of monkey. And in that location, the target of the call site is the banana constructor. In this location, we are calling put, but if we will examine the program, we will see that we are calling put of monkey class. And again and again, we have another call to put and another call to, uh, and a new call to warm constructor. And now we are calling it. Inside it, we are calling food.it. If we will examine the program, we will see that in that location, the only function that can be called is banana it or warm it. Those are the only two functions that can be called using a, on that location. So this is basically the relationship that we need in order to understand which 
element is reachable and which element is not reachable. We need to understand what are all the call sites in the program, and at each call site we need to understand what is the exact target, and we need to do it for all the program, to the open source, the direct dependency, the indirect dependency, and to the application. And that's all, basically. And if we will, all, if we will have this uh, relationship, we can, using that, we'll solve the vulnerability effectiveness problem. Lucky us, we have some data structure that will help us to, to, to build that. The data structure is called call graph. So call graph is this graph. is just a standard graph in computer science. The edges of the graph are the functions in the program, and the nodes of the graph are the functions in the program, and we have two node, two, an edge between two nodes if there is a potential call from, from uh, the, that, that function to the target function. And this is the call graph to, to the Hello World Python program, we, we, Python program we saw in the previous slides. We, saw, we see that we have a, an edge from main to monkey constructor, or from main to monkey put, or from main to monkey eat, and so on and so forth. If we will examine the monkey eat, we see that monkey eat has an edge, edge to banana eat or to worm eat. And if we will continue to look at that program, we see that the carrot constructor and carrot eat is not reachable from the main. So basically, if you will have this, this uh, call graph, we can reduce the problem of uh, calculating the vulnerability effectiveness to the problem of building that call graph. Because if we know that the that, uh, carrot eat has some vulnerability, we just need to build that call graph to do some kind of reachability, BFS, DFS, whatever, from the proprietary code function and see if the vulnerable element is reachable uh, uh, from the, one of the proprietary code functions. If so, we know that this vulnerability may be effective. Otherwise, we for sure know that uh, this function cannot be uh, reachable. Therefore, this is not effective. It's ineffective. And we can safely uh, live with that vulnerability in our code. Uh, all of these in some assumption that we have an accurate call graph. Of course, if we have some missing edge at the call graph, this will not be true. So we need an ac accurate call graph. Okay, so this is what we want to do, and this is the problem we want to solve. So how we can do that? We say just build a call graph. So it sounds very easy. The problem is that building a, a accurate call graph is undecidable program, a problem. It's impossible to build undecidable call graph. Not today, not tomorrow and not in 1,000 years in, uh, in some, uh, uh, in some uh, machine that equivalent to, to modern computer. Uh, so it's impossible to, to do it like that. So, so we cannot build the call graph. So what we can do, we can approximate the call graph. So we can use some approximation techniques, and there are several approximation te te techniques for building a call graph. One of the approximation techniques uh, produces a call graph which is uh, called under, uh, which will be under approximations uh, to the original call graph. Those uh, kind of techniques called complete. So if we have a complete algorithm for building the call graph, we know that we have an under approximation. And for understand that, let's look on this tiny program on the bottom uh, uh, left. So, so we say that complete is a part of the original call graph. So, so the original call graph in this tiny example needs to, suppose that all of this is inside main function. So, so this uh, tiny program contains uh, two edges at the call graph. Yes, we have an edge from main to F and from main to H, and G is not reachable uh, in that example. But the, 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 the algorithm produces a call graph with just one edge from main to F. So if the algorithm we, we, will, will uh, produce such graph for every program, this algorithm is called complete, and the graph that uh, it generated is under approximation. Uh, each missing edge, for example, this graph has missing, missing edge from main to H, is called false negative. So if we have complete algorithm, complete algorithm contains false negative, and the missing data from the original graph, because it's under approximation, it's called false negative. Okay, so, so this is complete graph, and let's think a moment uh, if this is good for our, our use case. Uh, of course not, because what we want to do, we want to calculate the 
vulnerability effectiveness, and we say that the important thing is the ineffective vulnerability. So if we have a complete call graph, we know that we are missing some of the edges. So if we are missing some of the edges and we see that something is not reachable, maybe it's not reachable because one of the missing edges. So, so we cannot use complete call graph to solve all our pro problem. Although complete call, call graph is very easy to, to build, we just need to, to run the program and record what's happened during the execution and then we can uh, see what is the relationship between the functions. So dynamic tools basically are based uh, uh, on that approach and generating an under approximation. And this is not good for us because, it's, uh, because we cannot uh, calculate the ineffective vulnerability. And in addition, we need a good approximation at the indirect dependency as we talk. And even if we have a great test that covers the application, even if in 100% testing coverage, we are, ch we are checking the testing coverage just on the proprietary code, not on the, not the, not on the open source. For, for getting tests that will cover the open source, one, not the, all the open source, but the reachable open source in 100%, it's almost impossible and very difficult to achieve, especially when we are talking on the indirect dependencies. So for all of those reasons, the dynamic uh, algorithm is not fit to our problems. Okay, so let's see what we can do. So we cannot use under approximation, maybe we can use an over approximation. Yes, we can, we can generate a graph that will contain the actual graph, but maybe contain some more edges. So the extra edges that are not true are called false positive. If we are generating a graph that contains all the information that we need with additional information, so the additional information is called false positive, and algorithm that produce all the information that we need with some false positive is called sound algorithm. So basically, sound algorithm is better because if something is not reachable in a sound call graph, we know that it's not reachable also in the reality, in the, in the actual call graph, so this is a very good to us and may solve our problem. To illustrate that, let's see again our tiny program. This, uh, we can see that this graph is an over approximation to the actual graph. We have an edge from main to H and from main to F, and this is great because this is the actual call graph, but we have some false positive edges. We have an unnecessary edges from main to T. This is just an edge that we don't need, and from main to G, for example, because uh, the, the algorithm didn't notice that this is an infinite loop and, the, and we cannot call G, call G, G function. So those, those kind of algorithm is good and, uh, and, and, and uh, basically we can use them to our pro problem, but we need to, care, to, to make sure that we don't have too much edges because it's very easy to, 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 to build a sound call graph. It's, it's a trivial problem. At any location we can, we can say everything is reachable. So if at every location we say everything is reachable, we have a great sound call graph, but not so accurate with a lot of false positive. Actually, everything is false positive and everything will be reachable. And in that case, we, everything will be effective and, uh, and we'll, we will not have any ineffective data. Our assumption, our thesis that we want to prove that most of the vulnerability are ineffective because we are using a fraction of some API uh, of the libraries and intuitively it looks like most of the most of the CV does not need to affect the application. So if everything will be effective, it's not good for us. So, so, so this is what we need to do. We, we need to build a sound call graph, but with a, a very good accuracy designed to our problem to get a, a, to understand that most of the code is ineffective. There are some tools that neither uh, sound nor complete, just generating some graph with a false positive, false negative, those ob obviously not good for us. For example, this, uh, this graph that may contain a, a call from main to F and main to, um, main to F, should the, this is the, the real edge, but missing the edge from main to H and as some extra edge from main to G, for example. So, so those tools are obviously not, not good. Okay, so we want to build a sound call graph and this is not a, an easy task. Let's see how, what are the trivial way to, to build a, a, a good approximation to the call graph. So if we have a, a strongly typed language like Java, there is some very easy and trivial way to build a call graph. We, for example, we want to know who can call from that location. We, can, uh, we, we know that it just can be uh, all the E that came from the inheritance of uh, that type, yes? So it can be that type if it's not an interface, of course, and, and all the descendants of that type. 
So this could be a good sound approximation to the call graph, uh, but the problem is that this approach will lead a lot of false positive and will not go to our uh, task because almost everything will be effective. Uh, for, for example, imagine that you have some interface in some library and many other libraries uh, that implement that interface, hundreds of implementation. Then every use of that interface will jump to every implementation, so, so it's not good and eventually it, 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 most of the code will be reachable with that approach. So, 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 so it's also not good, but this is a nice way and very efficient. So, so if, if someone can live with that approximation, so it will be a good way to approximate uh, the call graph. And in addition, this, is, this does not uh, deal with reflective call uh, like reflection in Java. So, so this is also not good. And in some languages, we don't have type at all, like Python. So in Python, we don't have type at all, so we cannot use that. In Python, we have some other approximation, some of the IDE usually doing something like that when we press jump to declaration. So what they are doing, they're just looking at the, they, it's called name-based uh, approaches. There is a set of algorithm uh, that are uh, very similar to that. So we, they, are, they are looking to, on some uh, function, they are looking at the signature of the function, the name, the arguments and everything, and they are assuming that every function with the same signature, the same name is called at that location. For example, the monkey eat, uh, uh, called the eat function, and the eat function as uh, uh, the same signature of the eat of monkey, then we, we, we may, the algorithm by mistake thinks that there is a recursion here. So, so this obviously also not good for us. It it's, will, will cause, even it it's, does not uh, deal with reflection again, reflective call, but even if do, uh, it will cause too much edges in the call graph and we'll have a lot of false positive and everything again will become effective. Okay, this is the actual call graph that we need for this tiny program. Okay, so, so those are the methods we talked so far. So beside the one entry that we'll talk about it in a moment. So there is the dynamic method. We say that the dynamic method is good from the fact that it does not contain false positive, but it contain, a, but it's complete and is under approximation. So it's not good to our use case because we, not, we cannot calculate the vulnerability effectiveness uh, using that, because if something is not effective, we don't know if we are missing something or it's really ineffective. And in addition, it's very complex to deploy such, such tool because it requires an input to, to execute the program. It, re, it requires require execution environment. We cannot just point the tool to some repo and say, scan it. We, we need to execute the code and we need to generate some data that, uh, that, that will execute the code with a good coverage to the open source, which is more uh, difficult to do. To, to, to. So this, this uh, dynamic method are not good for us, as we say. We say that static methods are better if we have sound approximation to the call graph. And we say that there are some simple static methods and we give just to, just for illustration, a class hierarchy a method if we have a strongly typed language and a name-based if we don't have type. And we say that also those are not good because they are not deal with reflective call and they are uh, generating too much edges at the call graph so everything eventually become uh, effective. There is another known method at the literature. Those, this method is great, basically, which is called uh, Anderson analysis or point to analysis. This method is, is very good. Uh, it basically does not also uh, deal with reflective call, but it is easily can be extended to deal uh, with reflective call, so it's not so difficult to do that. But the problem with that method is that, uh, but it's very precise and good for our use case. Uh, and there are a lot of open source that implementing this uh, basically. Um, but the problem with that, uh, with that method is that uh, it's not scale. If we will try to, to, to apply this method to even thousands of lines of code or not talking about millions or hundreds of millions of lines of code as we have in our use case because we are analyzing everything, the, the application and also the dependencies. So it will not scale, it will not stop, uh, and we can not use that method. So basically, at the literature as is, there isn't any good way to, to, to approximate the call graph for that use case because of scalability, because we are want to analyze the application and the dependencies, and we are talking on millions of lines of code when counting the dependencies. 
Because of that, in our company, we developed new approach to do that. Basically, what we did, we, we succeeded to, to, to develop new algorithm designed for this problem, for security vulnerability problem, that is from, from our uh, evaluation that we will see in a moment, for uh, it proven to be almost precise as the, as the point to analysis from one end, and also almost fast as the class hierarchy analysis. When we check, compare them, it was almost the same uh, regarding scalability, comparing to the simple static and uh, almost precise as a point to analysis. Okay, so, so this is what we did. Uh, we will not describe the algorithm here, but we will try to give you the intuition. Basically, the class hierarchy method is great method. So it can give us the types, it gives us all the information basically. But we cannot use that because most of the languages does not have type like Python. Uh, this is one reason. Another reason, uh, it gets too many types, too many false positive there. And it also does not uh, deal with reflective code, but let, 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 let us leave it for a moment. So we want to improve the, the class hierarchy. So what we are doing, basically, we are calculating the type, but we are calculating the dynamic type, not the static type. Basically, if we have some implementation of some interface with hundreds of uh, descendants, and we have one factory that uh, generate one instance, so we know that the type is this instance and, and not all other descendants. So, so what we did, we built abstract interpreter to the program that can very efficient interpret the program and understand what is the dynamic type at each location of the program. And uh, I will not go into detail, but I will try to give you intuition using this running example. Okay, so here on the top uh, right, you will see the type that we are uh, calculating, and on the top left, you will see the interpreter location. In that case, uh, the interpreter location is, uh, is uh, basically, basically here, I will see the, the time, okay. <laughs> it's, basically, it's basically here, so we want to analyze that program. Uh, so we know we have a call site, we are calling in a monkey constructor, so the interpreter on the fly build the call graph and understand that there is a call to the monkey constructor, so we have the first edge of the call graph. And where, when we are junking, uh, jumping a method, we are looking at the type that we know so far, and we are binding the types and adding at the type that already calculated till this point. And in that location, when we are jumping to this, look, to this we know that the self is bind to the monkey uh, type because this is, this is a constructor. So this is what we understand. And now uh, we know that a food, a food a field of that class is bind to basically to none, yes, to, to no type because we assign it a none in Python. And this is interpreter. So the interpreter know to, call, to return to the call site and know that we call a constructor and the return type of constructor is the, is the class. So it know to assign, assign M variable the dynamic type of the monkey. So the type of M will be the monkey. Now there, there is some integer operation. Now we are calling put. So again, as before, we are jumping to the banana and we are returning from the constructor. Again, the return type is banana and then we want to jump to put. But what put, what is put? Which function is put? We don't know, but we know the type of M. The type of N is monkey. So we know that at that location, we are basically jumping monkey put. So we are jumping monkey monkey put, and at the jump point, we are binding the types that we know. So, so we know that M type is monkey, so we'll bind safe to monkey, and, the, and then we, we know that we just return from the constructor and the return type is banana, so we bind the first argument to banana, and basically we are jumping that location and we bound, bound, uh, bind uh, those two uh, variable to those two types. And now, then we have a assi assignment for a food local variable with the type banana to full field. So when we do that, we know that at that location, full field is banana. Previously, it was one, no, none, but currently is banana. And then we will go to the worm. We will do the same uh, scenario again and again go to food. But now uh, the food local variable is bound to worm and not to banana. So in that case, we are assigning again and we know that Basically, the food can be non, banana, or warm uh, during the execution. Okay, so the interpreter will continue to the eat, uh, eat method, and now we want to jump to eat. So what is eat? We look at the type of M. M belongs to the type monkey. 
then we know what is it. It belongs to monkey. So we are jumping monkey. And now we want to, to jump food eat. What is food eat? We look at the type of food. The type of food is banana or worm. So we know that we are calling it of banana or worm, so we'll, we'll call that location. And by this, this is just a very high level, but by this, by calculating the dynamic type during the execution, we know how to deal and build the call graph, and we know how to deal even reflective call. Okay, so, but how accurate is it, and how fast is it? So if it's scaled to, to, to our problem. So let's see the evaluation. Okay, so first we, we, we want to, to have measurement for different metrics. The first metric is to see if it's accurate, if, if it's built the right call graph. It's very difficult to measure that because we don't have the actual call graph for a real application. So what we did, we did something a, a bit tricky. We took many projects, we ignore all the open source of that projects, but we choose projects with a very good testing coverage, assume close to 100 testing coverage. In that case, we assume, so this is assumption, we assume that when we run the application with those tests, so the call graph, but in the scope of the application, not the open source, is close to the actual call graph because the test, uh, uh, the test uh, basically uh, cover all the execution part of the application. So if we are ignoring the, the open source, we cannot do it in our use case, we must analyze the open source, but for that, just for measurement, we ignore the open source we build the dynamic call graph, we build the static call graph and then compare them. And the assumption is that the dynamic call graph on those projects is, clo is close to the actual uh, call graph because we, we, we choose a test with good, with good coverage. And this table is from the evaluation we did for Python. So we can see that the, I, I will say for a moment what is precision and recall. Precision is a way to measure the false positive. So if we have 90% uh, of precision, it means that we have 10% of false positive. And recall is for false negative. If we have 80% uh, of recall, it means that we have 20% of false negative. So this is a good way to measure the false positive and false negative ratio. So we saw that the precision is almost 90%. It means that we have only 10% of false positive. So we have a very accurate call graph. And we saw also the recall is great. So, but this is a bit uh, different than what I told you earlier. I told you that we have a sound algorithm. So if the, if the algorithm is sound, the regal must be 100%. Okay, so what we have a missing edges, what, why, what we don't have 100% here. This is because that in this evaluation, we didn't use the reflective uh, call uh, feature. So, so algorithms support reflection, but, but we didn't uh, implement uh, that in this evaluation. Therefore, we missed all the edges that came from a reflective call, and those edges, uh, are, we see them now as a false negative. Okay, so we saw the graph is really accurate, but what about performance, and what about the ability to calculate the ineffectiveness? So we did a test in .NET in Java. Let's see a, a piece of .NET evaluation, and that lo let's look in more detail in Java. Okay, so this is part of the .NET evaluation. We took uh, many public projects from GitHub, and uh, those projects contain vulnerabilities. We run our analysis and check what is effective and what is ineffective, and we, in, we saw that 63% uh, were ineffective. Uh, we did the same in Java. In Java, we did it on hundreds or even thousands of projects. We had automation that scanned basically GitHub uh, offline. So, and here we see just a, 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 a piece of this evaluation. Basically, the, the average was a, more than 70% of the vulnerability that the application is using, those applications in GitHub that they are using, their dependencies, 70%, more than 70% were ineffective. And here we can see the running time comparing the lines of code. So we can see that the line of code is huge because we, each, of, each one of those applications, if it, even if it was a tiny application, it used a lot of open source. And here we are cut, counting uh, everything, the open source and, 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 and everything. So, so we saw that most of it is ineffective. Okay, so let's see a small demo now. So basically, uh, we talk about JavaScript, we talk about Java, Python, uh, we talk about .NET, uh, Python, and uh, uh, Java. We didn't talk about uh, JavaScript. So let's do the demo in uh, JavaScript, basically. Just for this uh, demo, I ju just downloaded, uh, I downloaded it, uh, uh, 
project from uh, GitHub, just a arbitrary project with a vulnerability, and scan it. This is the link of the project. So let's scan uh, that project. So what we are doing when we're scanning, uh, what we are doing when we're scanning a project, we are analyzing the, the project, we are downloading the dependencies, we are seeing what de dependency has vulnerability, and we basically see that. Uh, basically, this project uh, uh, it took 27 uh, seconds to scan, and it contains three vulnerabilities. Those are the vulnerability of the project. Uh, uh, sorry, four, vulner four vulnerabilities. This contains two CVE. We see this green arrow. It means that do those are not effective. Uh, also, this CVE is not effective. On the other end, this CVE is effective, and we can see here the trace of that uh, CVE. Uh, I think that we're almost gone uh, out of time, so I cannot see the trace, but if you want, you can come at a break, and we will look at that in more details. But we have also all the traces uh, that form the application. Those are the traces from the application to the vulnerable element. Uh, and you can see that the scanning time uh, took about uh, 27 seconds for that project. Basically, this is a, not a huge project. This project contains uh, almost 28,000 lines of code. Small project, but still, it took 27 seconds to scan it. Uh, and we saw the evaluation that even a huge project took a minute to scan. To scan. Okay. So, so this is the summary. We saw that uh, this... Uh, uh, this uh, technique help us to prioritize the work. We can postpone most of the work to later sprint or to forget about that, that work at all. We saw the algorithm is scaled to real life scenario and uh, basically it's implemented in the company tool, Mend company, and, uh, and that's all basically. So now if you have some questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. So no question at this late time, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, I don't. Uh, what, what is the vulnerable function? Okay, so, so, so the question was how, when we have a vulnerability and when we have open source and the open source contains CVE, how do you know what is the vulnerable element? Okay, so this is a different lecture. We, we also develop, uh, develop a automation for that, uh, basically. Uh, we have a research group that's doing that, and we also develop automation tool for automatically calculate that. And in our database for each DV, we know exactly which is the vulnerable element. Mm. Yes? No. <laughs> this is a part of our uh, products of Mend Company. We have some community edition, uh, but uh, it's not open source. Mm. No, we, we are doing code analysis, basically. It's very similar technique that what's happened in a SAS tool, in a, and we are building a call graph, and then for when we have the call graph for generating the, the, the trace is trivial, it's just reachability on the graph. So when, when we have a vulnerable element and we have the proprietary function, we just see the trace at the call graph. And building the call graph, it's a proprietary algorithm that we have developed that we talk about. We didn't describe the algorithm, but, but we try to give the intuition behind that. So, so I think that that's all, yes? Okay. <laughs> so now if, <laughs> if you have more questions, you are welcome to, to come and ask.